Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of the Hugo Winners 1968-1970 by Isaac Asimov. Dane reads. So, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb uh, and let you know some of the stories in this. Asimov just uh, wrote the introductions and an introductory essay, and in fact they used the same introductory essay in part one as in part two, which was kind of confusing. I think the first two books were originally released as like a bind-up rather than individually, so that's why, but yeah. Isaac Asimov has compiled the brilliant short stories that won the coveted Hugo Award at the 26th to the 28th World Science Fiction Conventions. They are Weir Search by Anne McCaffrey, Riders of the Purple Wage by Philip Jose Farmer, Gonna Roll the Bones by Fritz Lieber, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream by Harlan Ellison, Nightwings by Robert Silverberg, The Sharing of the Flesh by Paul Anderson, The Beast That Shouted Love at the Heart of the World by Harlan Ellison, and Time Considered as a Helix of Semi-Precious Stones by Samuel R. Delaney. Now, I will say right off the back, I did enjoy this one more than the first collection. Uh, we'll start here with uh, Asimov's introduction to Anne McCaffrey, which I think is, I'm gonna read the full thing, why not? Um, but yeah, this was uh, an interesting little story because it was a Pern story and I've never read any of those before. Although I would argue they were almost more fantasy than sci-fi, but hey ho, right. Anne McCaffrey is a woman. Yeah, she is. You notice it instantly. Biggie. What makes this remarkable is that she's a woman in a man's world and it doesn't bother her a bit. Science fiction is far less a man's world than it used to be as far as the readers are concerned. Walk into any convention these days and the number of shrill young girls fluttering before you, if you are Harlan Ellison, or backing cautiously away, if you are me, is either frightening or fascinating, depending on your point of view. I am the fascinated type. The writers, however, are still more masculine by a heavy majority. What's more, they are a particularly sticky type of male, used to dealing with males, and a little perturbed at having to accept a woman on an equal basis. It's not so surprising. Science is a heavily masculine activity, in our society anyway, so science fiction writing is, or should be, isn't that the way it goes? And then in comes Anne McCaffrey with snow white hair and a young face, the hair colour is premature, and Juno-esque measurements and utter self-confidence, talking down mere males whenever necessary. I get along simply marvellously well with Annie. Not only am I a woman's lib from long before there was one, but I have the most disarming way of goggling at Juno-esque measurements, which convinces any woman possessing them that I have good taste. In August 1970, Annie and I were co-guests of honour at a science fiction conference in Toronto. That meant one certain thing. We had another of our perennial Songfest competitions. We sing at each other very loudly, and finally we work ourselves up to a climax, which is always when Irish eyes are smiling. We each have our pride, of course, not so much in any skill at singing, but in loudness and range. And while everyone in the audience gets far out to non-wincing distance, we get louder and higher. I happen to have a resonant baritone, but Annie perversely refuses to consider me anything but a tenor. Never trust a tenor, she says darkly. It always ends the same way. At the final note, she takes a deep breath and holds. I do too, but before the minute is up, I fade, choke and halt, while that final note of Annie's keeps right on going, loud, shrill and piercing, for an additional 15 seconds at least. And then everybody applauds, and when I say it's not fair, she has spare lungs, and point at her aforesaid Juno-esque proportions, no one seems to care. Annie is in Ireland now for a lengthy stay, and I miss her. And we get this uh, quote from Anne McCaffrey's story, which I thought was good. Flowers stared down at the dead man. There was no pleasure in killing, he realised, only relief that he himself was still alive. All right, so moving on to Riders of the Purple Wage by Philip Jose Farmer, and I just love the fact, this was a great story actually, probably the best one in the collection. Um, but we have Grandpa, Grandpa Winnegan, he has an unpublished manuscript called How I Screwed Uncle Sam and Other Private Ejaculations. And you know how much I love spying ejaculations. So the quote here to kick off the story. If Jules Verne could really have looked into the future, say AD 1966, he would have crapped in his pants. And 2166, oh my. And I just, this tickled me the way it was written. Uh, so this is part of the story, uh, part of the same story called The Ancient Marinator. The ancient marinator, I call myself. A marinade of wisdom steeped in the brine of oversalted cynicism and too long a life. You smile so. You must have just had a woman, Chip teases. No, my boy. I lost the tension in my ramrod 30 years ago. And I thank God for that, since it removes from me the temptation of fornication, not to mention masturbation. However, I have other energies left, hence scope for other sins. And these are even more serious. Aside from the sin of sexual commission, which paradoxically involves the sin of sexual emission, I had other reasons for not asking that old black magician science for shots to starch me out again. I was too old for young girls to be attracted to me for anything but money, and I was too much a poet, a lover of beauty, to take on the wrinkled blisters of my generation or several just below mine. So now you see my son, my clapper swings limberly in the bell of my sex. Ding dong, ding dong, a lot of dong but not much ding. And another quote from Grandpa's manuscript here. There are universes begging for gods, yet he hangs around this one looking for work. Great quote. And another great quote. Uh, great art like an onion brings tears to the eyes. 
And then another bit that just tickled me, so this little bit of conversation here. You said you was just going to use your finger, she shouts. She points at the slightly rounded belly. I'm going to have a baby, you rotten smooth talking sick bastard. That isn't true at all, Chib says. You told me it was alright, you loved me. Love, love, he says. What the hell do I know what I said? You got me so excited. Anyway, I didn't say you could stick it in. I'd never say that, never. And then what you did, what you did. My God, I could hardly walk for a week, you bastard, you. Another quote from Grandpa. There is nothing as ridiculous as the verbal outpourings of a young poet in love. Outrageously exaggerated. I laugh, but I'm also touched. Old as I am, I remember my first loves. The fire, the torrents of words, lightning sheathed, ache winged. Dear lasses, most of you are dead, the rest withered. I blow you a kiss. Grandpa's kind of poetic, you know? And then this, this is a fact that I've heard of before, but it was just interesting to see it out in the wild, so to speak. What to do now? The ancient Greeks placed defective babies in the fields to die. The Eskimos shipped out their old people on ice flows. Should we gas our abnormal infants and senile's? Sometimes I think it's the merciful thing to do. But I can't ask somebody else to pull the switch when I won't. All right, then we have I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream by Harlan Ellison. Very famous short story. I, I gotta admit, I thought the concept of this was better than the story itself. Um, but we do get this, which I quite like. This is um, what the machine is saying. In a pillar of stainless steel bearing neon lettering. Hey, let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. There are 387.44 million miles of printed circuits and wafer thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nano angstrom of those hundreds of million miles, it would not equal one one billionth of the hate I feel for humans at this micro instant for you. Hate. Hate. So here I want to read the introduction to the piece by Robert Silverberg, another great introduction here. Robert Silverberg has a distinctly satanic look about him. He cultivates it. His ambition is to give girls delicious shivers when he looks at them. Maybe he does, who knows, but when he looks at me, he gives me no delicious shivers, just a feeling of apprehension. Don't say it, I say. Sometimes he doesn't say it, and that's good because whatever it is he's thinking of saying, it's bound to be sardonic. It's part of the Satanism. He's got this dark beard which he first grew when he was nine years old, I think, and dark hair and beady glittering dark eyes, and a dark IQ of about 250. And he's wearing me out, that's what he's doing. You see, he's one of these characters who works day and night and publishes books by the dozen, both fiction and non-fiction, and in a variety of fields. He can work quickly, he can work well, he can work on anything. Right away I feel bitter, because I copyrighted that sort of thing and he's violating the copyright. What's more, whenever he goes into a public library he's never been in before, he checks how many different titles they have of his and compares it with how many different titles they have of mine. Then he calls me up to complain. This nuisance must cease, he tells me. Does he think I want it to continue? I would love slowing it down and taking it easy. I would love putting my heels up on a hassock and dream the hours away, but how can I? If I stop turning it out, poor Bob won't have that carrot in front of him, urging him on, driving him forward. Does he think I'm writing all those books for me? But I have an idea for a substitute. In a recent book, The Tower of Glass, Robert describes in clinical detail a sex act between a male android and a female android. At its conclusion, the male android is depressed and tired and empty, and the female android tells him that's the way men always feel. Since that is news to me, I am thinking of suggesting a bit of counter-propaganda. Let any male who happens to make love and who finds that, except for a certain welcome relaxation, he feels fine and happy afterward, get to his feet, flex his muscles, take a deep breath and cry loudly, the heck with you Robert Silverberg, I feel great. What better way of making Bob immortal? Big E. This movement might sweep the world, encouraging all men to a healthier attitude towards sex and proving of infinite psychological value. Countless generations will pass in which men and women both will be all the better and happier for it and will say gratefully, this is wonderful, but tell me who is Robert Silverberg? Of course, if you want to substitute anything more appropriate to the occasion with the heck with you, that's all right with me. All right, and then the intro here on Paul Anderson. In every field, there is such a thing as an old pro. Usually they are the reliables, the one who can be counted on to do the hard work, to do it well and to do it quickly. What's more, they do it with a minimum of headache and heartache. It's a funny thing, but it is usually the rank amateur who throws a fit over a changed comma, or who sinks back bleeding over the necessary editorial touch. Science fiction has a hard job keeping its old prose, however. It is a notoriously poorly paying field, and a notoriously demanding one. Those who write science fiction must not only develop all the usual skills of any writer, they must also learn how to extrapolate new societies, incorporate science cleverly, and keep forever up to date in the most inexorably changing field in the world. Many don't manage to reach the point where they more than marginally qualify, but some learn in these exacting surroundings and come to be in great demand. They can write science fiction for the national magazines that pay well, they can write for movies and television, they can write popular science or other brands of non-fiction. 
Everything else pays more than science fiction, and the temptation to graduate is enormous. With hanging head and quivering lip, I must admit that I am not one of those who resisted graduation. Except for my monthly articles in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, I hardly appear in the science fiction magazines anymore. Oh, occasionally I do. I'm not an utter villain. Just the same, let us honour the outstanding practitioners who are skillful enough to win Hugos, yet who have been staunchly serving as bulwarks of the magazine field for 20 years and more. Fritz Leiber's first story in the magazines appeared in 1939, Jack Vance's in 1945, and Gordon Dixon's in 1950. Still, for a combination of quantity and quality, I would like to nominate good old Paul Anderson. His first story, as I recall, appeared in 1947, and I don't think a year has passed since then without his having contributed several good stories to the field. It's not that he can't do anything more lucrative, I know he can. It's just that he has science fiction in him, and thank goodness he wants to get it out. Of course, not everything about Paul is to be admired. Many anthologies, listings, publishers' blurbs, etc. list authors alphabetically, which is exactly the way to do it, as we would all agree. By that system, I am very often in first place, where I belong. But whenever Paul is also present, it is he who takes pride of position because Anne becomes ahead of as. Obviously, Paul must be doing that on purpose, and you'll have to admit it's rather mean of him. Okay, moving on to the introduction to Samuel R. Delaney. Samuel R. Delaney is the baby of the book. He's been publishing science fiction for something like eight years, and instead of serving a decent apprenticeship, I slaved away for something like umpty ump years before somebody happened to trip over me and said, whatever is that? He started attracting notice right away. It's enough to rouse the instinctive hatred of any decent, hard-working incompetent. What else can I tell you about him? He has finely chiselled features, and he occasionally sports a beard. I don't just mean a beard, I mean a beard. He lets it grow out on all sides without warning. One day he hasn't got one and is as smooth shaven as a Colorado hero. The next day there he is looking like the inside of a horsehair mattress. He claims it keeps his face warm in the winter. Also, don't call him Sam. He doesn't answer to Sam. If you yell Sam at him, Sam Moskovitz is liable to turn around and then you'll be sorry. Samuel I. Delaney is called Chip. Please don't ask me why because I don't know why. If he were a disciple of Robert Block, I would say it was because he's a chip off the old block, but he isn't a disciple of anybody. And yet there's something a little distressing to me here that I might as well mention. For years, we science fiction writers, we warm band of brothers and sisters, have entered this field as our speciality. It was our thing, it was what we did. Often, if we were driven enough, we graduated to broader fields, but even then, as in my own case, we had lingered long enough to know that science fiction was our home, our only true literary home, no matter through what gilded palaces we rambled. But now the day has come when writers, without necessarily feeling a tight identification with the field, choose to write science fiction because of the liberty it gives them. The opportunity to speculate and experiment beyond anything possibly in any other genre. I think that's meant to be anything possible. Do they then think of themselves as science fiction writers? Is this their home or just another hotel room? I wonder about Chip, for instance. He reached the top so easily that he may have had no sensation of passing through. Next time I see him, I'll ask. And just one thing here in that story that I highlighted. So there's just this line that, um, it's a bit of the world building, I'm not gonna go into the full detail, but this line was great. Singers are people who look at things, then go and tell people what they've seen. What makes them singers is their ability to make people listen. This is the most magnificent oversimplification I can give, but it works well for the purposes of this video. So yeah, uh, the Hugo winners 1968 to 1970, edited by Isaac Asimov. Uh, as you can tell, I particularly liked uh, Riders of the Purple Wage by Philip Jose Farmer. That was easily the best in this one. Uh, I have no mouth and I'm a scream. I was a little disappointed by it because I've heard so much about it. And it was okay. As I say, it was a great concept. I just wasn't too keen on the execution. Um, but hey ho, overall I enjoyed this more than the first edition. This one was a pretty solid 3.5 out of 5 for me. So there we have it, that's what I made of the Hugo winners, edited by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Biggie, stop meowing.